Okay. Uh, so, Luca, yeah, the floor is yours. Uh, you, you can start with the presentation or introduce yourself or whatever. The floor is yours. Again, you have something like 45 minutes to one hour. And uh, then uh, if you're okay, we can have a small discussion. Absolutely. Uh, uh, thank, thank you, you very so much. much for being with us. The floor is yours. Oh, again. Thank, thank you. Thank you for the kind invitation. Um, really happy to be here. I think it's. Um, I, I was saying to you, it's a really um, timely moment. Um, as you uh, introduced, this is an old idea of mine. I think it's. Uh, it's safe to to say that is an idea that motivates my PhD at the very beginning. I didn't know exactly how to develop this idea back then, uh, but now luckily I managed to think about to to, to get to, to spend more time and thinking about it and i think i have a, a let's say i had an idea to how to to shape it. so um it's still a work in progress that's um so i'm still not completely satisfied with all of the assumptions that i made and all of the results but i think it's getting interesting and i hope uh to to be able to kind of you know uh uh, to to share this uh, this uh, this excitement with you, uh, as uh, because it's a it's a work in progress. I I think it's quite important to get any kind of comments, critiques, also harsh critiques. If you think something it's really odd, uh, it's a very nice moment to you know just uh, turning the box around and then empty the and and then just restart the work. So uh, yeah, please. Um, so uh, let me start from the title. Uh, it's a taking and no giving. It's an old song uh, by Dolly Parton. It's uh, I will I will show you. There's a little bit of a, of an Easter egg at the end of the presentation. So, uh, but it's motivated by the fact that it's um, this paper has to do with the uh, relationship between effort put at work by workers and their capacity to learn uh, to learn from what they are doing. I frame this relationship into, into the concept, uh, within the concept of organizational innovation. So the ability of a company to modify, to adjust their way to organize, control, and monitor the labor force within the company. And for the purpose of uh, retain information. So to for the purpose of not letting some information uh, spilled out in the market and to the benefit of rivals. So that's protecting secrets with the uh, a new way of organizing the labor force. Um, as I mentioned, this project is a little bit at the inter at the let's say at, at the border between I/O and uh, and uh, and labor economics. It's still an I/O oriented paper, but I, I try to make some some assumption that allow the allow the research question and the methodology to get closer to other to other things to, to get it as in this in interdisciplinary as possible. Uh, I, I don't know if it's, I succeeded in that. I tried to, but and, and I, I would like to know your opinion at the end of the talk. So let me start with a bit of a motivation. Uh, of course, I forgot to mention that you are free to interrupt me every time. So it's not necessary to wait for the Q&A period. If you have any question, just uh, let me know. Um, so um, let's start with some of the some, some definition and motivation. So I, I borrowed the definition of organization and innovation from the Oslo Manual, uh, which is the, inter the implementation of new organizational methods. Uh, these can be changes in business practices in workplace organization, the emphasis is mine, and uh, or in firm external relations. So I borrow you know, this uh, change in workplace organization as the organizational innovation. So every time I mention organizational innovation or uh, uh, management control over the workforce, I'm actually referring to this. And 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 I basically coupled coupled this in uh, this definition with some let's say fast stylized fact. Uh, one of the most important one is that the rapid progress of digital and and, and therefore also data the data tracking uh, technology have somehow allowed firms to expand their way to um, to organize the labor force within the within the within the company boundaries. Um, so to some extent, no, you have all this um, new um, machine machineries uh, at the uh, within the company. Uh, these are uh, from industrial machinery to laptop to PC to also, um, the badge that you have to scan to enter in a room or not, those are basically data points. 
every interaction of the workers with that equipment, with that particular piece of equipment or piece of machine machinery uh, generates data. And those data can be organized, can be, you know, can be checked and can be compared. And that allows also a new diffusion of new practices, new, new organizational practices. Uh, one of the most famous, which is not definitely new, but has been progressing since many, many years, decades actually, is gamification. So the kind of the, the, the tendency to create, um, let's say, uh, playful moments within, uh, within, the, within the production process. Uh, one of the last example of gamification is the, the introduction of leaderboards within the, within the company uh, production facilities. So um, the, basically the idea is that each worker can perform the task and the and by performing their tasks, they are actually collecting points, and those points are screened into a leaderboard, so a board that is publicly uh, available or at least available to the managers, uh, and 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 those leaderboard can be used to compare the performances of workers, and of course, being constantly at the top allows you to collect rewards, being there like you know uh, bonuses or additional holidays or so or so. And being at the, constantly at the bottom might create problems in terms of, uh, uh, of job stability. Um, so uh, those ways, uh, so those, those new ways of uh, organizing labor are there also to prompt and to fuel uh, productivity. So the idea is that I will generate incentive for workers to be more productive, as productive as possible. Um, very recently, uh, well, very recently, it's already uh, four years ago, um, um, a paper, uh, I, I encountered this paper by Jean Frommer as a legal scholar from the New York University. Um, and, and that paper was about, it's actually quite interesting. I suggest you to, to give it a read. It's a paper about the implication of uh, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence on IP protection uh, uh, policies. Uh, and the paper was making this parallelism between uh, the machines uh, and the, the computer and the, and the artificial intelligence as kind of entities that are within the firm, but are not uh, traditional agents of the, of the firm environment. Uh, she was making this kind of, um, um, let's say, connection with the, um, with the Oompa Loompas of the uh, Willy Wonka chocolate factory, you know, some, uh, workers are basically into the uh, social environment of the factory so you, you hire some worker who lives in the city where the factory uh, where the factory is but computers are not like this no are just we, they, uh, they only exist within the company they talk with just to each other they communicate within each other they are loyal to the company and not to other people uh, because of course are machines at the end of the day and they are much better to collect and retain data because they do not talk with other companies and they do not walk away from the company where they are uh, implementing and the and the transfer of the constant transfer of uh, knowledge from the working body to the machine body uh, may have implication in the ability of firms to uh, protect secrets and therefore to increment the share of trade secrets with respect to patents uh, that may be achieved by fragmenting the task of the worker. So before workers could have done like, you no know, larger share of the production process and therefore become expert of larger chunks of the production process. And now due to micro task allocation, they can only narrow and they can only focus on um, a small, uh, uh, small task or micro task in fact. And that prevent them to understand completely or at, to the same extent, the whole production process and the whole phases of the production process, which has an impact on how much information you can develop, how much touch it into information you can develop. Now, uh, the, my paper does, I, does not have uh, anything to do with IP protection laws, uh, but I borrow this intuition uh, to, um, to, to develop my, my idea. So uh, the, the, let's say that this first slide uh, try to uh, provide you a tale of new technologies allowing new way of monitoring workers and by uh, introducing more, uh, um, more instruments, more digital technology, more uh, data points, so more uh, collection of data. And those, let's say those techniques 
uh, might have an impact on the ability of workers to appropriate knowledge creation, uh, knowledge that comes from the company, being these like uh, factual trade secrets or just information. The second part of the motivation comes um, from the in increasing interest from the policymaker uh, uh, perspective on the worker relation, the worker condition. Uh, I think it's it, it's not a it's it's not a super recent thing. Um, the in 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 uh, at the beginning of her uh, mandate as uh, the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, in in her initial statement, expressed and highlighted how. Uh, worker conditions, uh, employment conditions were a, a, an important part of the European Commission policy. Um, so it's not something that has emerged in the last couple of years, but in the last couple of years, there has been a, a new uh, development on the other side of the Atlantic, which is the Federal Trade Commission, an antitrust commission, uh, decided to intervene on a particular clause that binds contractual laws in the United States, mostly also in, in Europe, but to a, a fewer extent, to a lesser extent, which are non-competing clauses. So basically clauses that workers have to sign with a company and that prevent them. So if signed, the, basically workers are not allowed anymore to uh, join a rival company or to establish business in a competing market uh, with the former employer. Um, and that is because maybe uh, during, the, uh, during the former employment, the workers may have been in contact with some crucial and vital and valuable information, and it might be uh, incentivized to use that information to unfairly compete ag against the actual owner of those information. So to prevent that, there is some clauses that prevents the worker from joining a rival in a specific time span and in a specific uh, geographic uh, region. Now, um, the interesting thing is that this is... Mm, arguably uh, uh, an instrument that is there also to protect trade secrets, so to protect information uh, uh, keeping uh, uh, so, uh, intellectual properties or some form of intellectual properties. But in the years, uh, there has been uh, publicly anecdotal evidence, and I think that the Federal Trade Commission is now gathering more structural evidence about it, that those kind of clauses have been uh, largely abused in the United States. So to the extent that also cashiers in fast food are subject to non-competing clauses, which is arguably a sector where knowledge creation is not important. So um, due to this, to, to this region, to this reason, and because non-competing clauses create friction in, in the labor market, so basically there to prevent workers to join their most favorable option after the after the termination of unemployment, the, the Federal Trade Commission decided to jump in, to jump in and, and propose a ban that should be discussed next year. Now, um, I remember that when I was doing the PhD, I came across to this paper. It's an old one by Lipsking in International, uh, sorry, in uh, Industrial and Corporate Change, 1997, um, where the author uh, highlighted how firms may deploy mechanisms that other than legal ones. Uh, to defend against appropriation. So understanding what the firms can do to keep their organizational secrets indeed secrets is an important question from the point of view of the theory of the firm. And, and I think this is kind of related because the, all the discussion is, in my opinion, uh, which might be biased, but I think it's, um, it's a little bit, um, it's a concern that is, little, that is shared, let's say. Um, there is not a lot of the, let's say, um, the implications of this ban uh, might not be completely assessed. So what the firms could do to react to this ban in order to obtain the same, uh, um, the same level of IP protection is something that the Federal Trade Commission, mostly because it's not um, its task not to, to deal with uh, intellectual pro protection uh, issues, um, have considered. So let's say this paper proposed um, a theory of the determinant of organizational innovations, uh, which is defined as a change in workplace organization that increases the control of management over the workforce. So uh, to some extent, it lowers the autonomy of the workers and their ability to collect information and try to answer the following uh, research question. So do firms have the incentive to adopt such uh, organizational innovations 
and to use it, uh, to use them in order as a mechanism to, that allows them to protect uh, against knowledge spillover, so to protect their organizational secrets. Um, this theory is based on the definition that I have to, of uh, organizational innovation, which is the ability of the company or the manager, depending on how you think about the, uh, the, the, the decision making inside the company, um, the ability of that subject to elicit effort from the worker's perspective. So how much effort should the workers um, put in their task, in performing their task? The lower the autonomy of the worker, the more is the ability of the management to increase this, um, this request. Now, before jumping into the model, let me just uh, briefly uh, list um, the relevant literature and the contribution of this paper, in, or the intended contribution of this paper inside the literature. Now, first, um, of course, there's a literature on innovations and on the organizational innovation in particular. Uh, I would say the economics literature have mostly dealt with the organizational innovations uh, topic from an empirical perspective. Uh, and also, uh, also in the empirical, empirical side of the, of the story, uh, just uh, only when it comes to complementarity with other forms of innovation. I think there are obvious reasons for doing that. One is that it's kind of difficult to model uh, organizational innovation because it requires a little bit of a uh, either to, um, to, 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 to crack open the, the black box of production or to uh, make a, a kind of um, way around it, which, I, which is what I try to do. Um, and the second is that, let's say, it's the reason why uh, in, uh, in, on the empirical side, uh, um, only complementarity has been, uh, has been or mostly complementarity has been studied is because organizational innovations are few, um, uh, let's say, indicator. No, I mean, you cannot use investment level. You cannot count patents or, uh, or uh, patent application. Um, and it's kind of difficult to understand how to measure the implementation of organizational innovation. Um, the biggest, let's say, attempt has been done to try to link in adoption of information and communication technology uh, which allows a decentralization, a decentralization of the of the production, and that has been uh, assumed as a as a as a proxy for organizational innovation. And 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 basically, the the idea is to try to understand how uh, a more um, centralized or decentralized company react to uh, different innovation sites. Okay. Um, well, despite the economic side of the literature has been, um, so my, sorry, my contribution in this respect is to offer a formal model uh, of competition that should be able to target and to, uh, and to apply to in context where firms can invest in uh, organizational innovation, or, or rather can decide to adjust the level of organization in their, uh, in their, uh, in their company. Um, to, to do so, to model this, um, this, this way, uh, to model the way firms can adjust their level of organization, I borrow from the organization and management studies and from their definition of organizational innovation, mostly coming from surveillance technology, as in Levi, um, to uh, gamification, as in Bartel and Garoud, and so on and so forth. Um, the second contribution it comes from the literature on workers' autonomy, the relationship between workers' autonomy and learning. Um, there are some recent publications there. Um, I would only focus on the, I would only um, mention the very recent paper by Veronica Rattini from the University of Bologna on the Journal of Economics and Management Strategy, who actually designed an experiment and found out that um, highly cognitive workers uh, are um, negatively affected in their productivity the moment you um, restrain them in terms of autonomy. So you restrain them in their uh, possibility of choosing the order and the time all allocated to uh, each task. Um, from a more I.O. oriented uh, literature, um, the, the work by Gersbach and Schmutzler around in 2012, uh, I think probably, mm, provides me with a, with a, with a strong 
um, reference point in terms of how competition uh, generates effects on the incentive of company to train workers. Um, in their case, um, training was mostly, um, um, let's say, uh, It was mostly directed to performance in terms of you know uh, of R and D, um, and 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 the main idea which is missing in my in my at the moment in my uh, in my project it was that uh, the incentive was coming from uh, uh, from the labor market interaction. So the ability of a firm to poach the workers of the other company uh, eventually generates incentive to um, to invest in to invest or disinvest in training. And finally, uh, my paper, of course, proposed, um, um, let's say, uh, an opinion on the potential effects of a proposed of, of the ban in non-competing clauses. And it basically tried to enter into the very, very new discussion, uh, which I think uh, has been apexed by, um, by Xi, uh, Econometrica paper in 2023, uh, this year, um, who actually proposed a full ban as a socially uh, optimal uh, choice. And my let's say my contribution here is, uh, if I can so bold to contradict uh, an economic on a economic paper, which I, I don't I don't necessarily am, I'm not necessarily am, um, is that in fact, if you take into account possible reactions of the firm, and if you take into account the reaction that I model in this, uh, in this, uh, in this um, project, uh, that might not be always the case. So it might be the case only under some particular condition, and in particular when uh, the um, uh, when the use of non-competing clauses is directed toward the lower end of the market in terms of uh, knowledge creation. So only when it comes to abuse. Um, but yeah, let me uh, show Sorry, you. Luca, can I ask something about the previous slide? Uh, what is NCC? Non what is this? Uh... Ah, I see. Okay, okay. Yeah, it's so this. The... Uh, I try to understand what this ban is about. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's just basically you see. cannot prevent workers to join the rival anymore, which is. Uh, which is an oversimplification because there are other uh, pieces of legislation that operate the way. In the United States, there is the um, inevitable disclosure doctrine. Some states, just as a legal doctrine, prevent workers to join uh, arrival after termination. So in this case, non-competing clauses are kind of redundant. There are other um, NDA kind of binds the same type of workers, so you cannot disclose information in any case. So, I mean, it's an oversimplification, but it works in that direction. I see. I see. Thanks. No problem. It's for asking. Uh, so, let's start with the model. I will show you, uh, I will start with a general uh, version of the model, so in a reduced form, and I will show you that it applies to many competition models. So, think about a couple of companies competing against each other. Uh, the way they compete is irrelevant now. Uh, just assume that just sorry, just bo uh, bear with me and uh, and consider those two firms are firstly deciding on the management control level, so the level of uh, basically the in a, in other words the the, auto the worker autonomy level. But I will use management control over the workforce as the main uh, um, as the main variable, uh, which is. Um, which is indexed by, which is basically defined as this letter T that goes from zero, meaning no effort will be put by the worker, to an upper bound that can be as large as one uh, may want and is the equivalent of the level above which the workers is willing to leave the job because it's simply too tiring to work for that. To that company. So it's basically endogenous, it should be endogenous on a worker utility function. In this case, it's treated as a as a as a parameter, but is the, the, the micro foundation would be um a, an exit option for the workers that generates uh this uh, threshold. Um the payoff from the competition states are uh, defined as a pi greco as a pi. Uh, which is uh, a function of the productivity level A, capital A, of the two firms, of the relative, let's say, productivity level. So if I'm more productive than my rival, I will earn a larger payoff. If I'm less productive, 
I will learn a less payoff. And if both productivity increases, the payoff will increase. So it's basically the more productive the firm, the best is the payoff from the competition stage. Now, the productivity level depends on three main components. And this is where we will focus on today. So one is the what I call the output per worker effect, which is basically the, the moment you ask a worker to be uh, to put more effort, it will produce more. It will do more tasks um, in, in, in a specific unit of time. Then there is the learning effect that depends both uh, directly on the effort and on the level of quantity. So basically, starting from the second, it's learning by doing. So if I do more tasks, I learn more. But uh, it's a costly action. So the, the, the larger the effort that I should put into production, the lower the level of learning uh, from doing. So basically, you have. Um, I think it's more clear here, is the second effect. Uh, basically, this part of the parenthesis is the extensive margin. I do more tasks, so I basically I can learn from more data points. And this is the extensive margin. But uh, the effort that I have to put into production is so large, that actually my attention to our learning is reduced, and therefore the intensive margin decreases. So you have a kind of trade-off, which is kind of proved by, by, by um, works on productivity uh, in learning and, um, and fatigue. So effort can be proxied as a level of fatigue in this, in this context. And finally, there is this effect here, which is S, uh, small s, which is the, basically the spillover effect. So there's a chance that some of the information, some of the human capital generated by the, by the workers, so the, the knowledge that they are able to learn toward learning, might actually spill to the other firm in the market. Now, uh, this is the, um, let's say, most, the, 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 I would say the largest limitation of this model in this, uh, in this uh, presentation. I have results on the, on, on uh, sorry, and, and the limitation is that it's a static game. So there is only one period of the game and circulation is defined as a probability of spillover. So with some probability, workers will circulate in the market and generate a spillover effect. Now, the proper way of doing should be to consider more periods. And between each period, you have a job market where workers you know, circulate in the labor market and, and generate endogenously the spillover. I'm working toward the direction. I have some results, but not enough to include them into the presentation. So I wanted to present you the, let's say, um, more toy version, which though according to the few results that I have are, let's say, they, they, they go in the same direction, qualitatively speaking. So uh, I think it's uh, most of the results that I will present you today survive the multi-period game. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned, the output per worker effect, um, the output per worker effect is basically how uh, the yes. output increase. Sorry, Luca, can I interrupt yes. again? Sorry for this. Can you go back to the components of uh, this A thing, the, the previous slide, I think it was. Okay, so uh, the spillover then is a function of learning only of the other guy. Okay, I see. Exactly. No, now I see. Okay, so exactly. the more spillovers on the other guy's side, the better it's for me. Exactly. And in fact, okay. here is not in AKA, but is in AH. So, I see. Uh, okay. Thanks. Thanks for that. No, no problem. Thanks for the, the question. So starting from the, the, the um, you know, I, I'm, I'm willing to work with general uh, function of the payoff. Uh, so in a reduced form model. So I have to make a couple of assumptions uh, to make it uh, doable. The first one is on the output per worker effect, which I assume to be increasing and concave. So the more effort the worker put, the more it produced but there are diminishing returns, which I think it's a safe assumption. It's not even necessary, it's just sufficient, but I think it's a, a, a safe assumption. The second one is on the learning effect, which is the stronger assumption, and I had to microfound it, actually. Uh, so um, we have two components. One is the direct effect. So you increase the effort and you decrease the level of learning due to fatigue. 
And then you have the other one, which is you increase the effort, you increase the number of tasks that you do, and that increase the level of learning because you are doing more stuff. Uh, and the second one is um, follows, uh, let's say, the, the function, the, the, the shape of the function of Q, so it's concave. Uh, whereas the other one is bad. So if you if you grow tired, you keep on learning less and less and less. Um, this is a strong assumption. Uh, I have uh, some motivation in the paper on uh, on some evidence uh, of this uh, of this uh, let's say shape. But I also have a micro foundation uh, for uh, for the for the function itself. And the idea is consider you have a worker who has a portfolio of effort which is given by this uh, E-bar, no? the maximum level of effort that you are willing to put before leaving, before quitting the, the employment. And the, the manager asks you to put some level of effort into, le into, sorry, into production. So you, are lot, you have uh, the availability of uh, the difference between your maximum level of effort and the one required for production to allocate toward uh, toward learning. Now, what happens is that if you start from zero, you have an increase in effort will increase Q, will increase the level of output that you produce. And that outcompensate the fact that you are getting tired because you are basically, you are at the very beginning of your, uh, of your curve. So you are not getting so tired. Eventually, at some point, there will be a point in which this relationship reverses. And you, despite you are increasing the number of tasks that you do, but you are doing so at a decrease at the mar at a decreasing return, then you keep on growing uh, tired, and eventually the cost will uh, compensate the marginal benefit. Um, let's say this is the um, strongest assumption of the model. If this uh, is um, accepted, I think naturally. Um, all the other assumptions are just, let's say, traditional assumption in, in economics. So diminishing return. And the last one is that the over effect is basically smaller than the direct effect. So if I learn something that is useful for, to work in this company and I move to another company, that information is less valuable there. There is a level of firm specific, specificity, uh, which is kind of safe to assume. Okay. So graphically, in order to kind of get a little bit of, uh, of an idea of what's happening, graphically speaking is that we have the output worker effect, which looks like this. We have the, on the graph on the left, we have productivity on the vertical, effort on the horizontal, and the output per worker effect that works like the productivity level that works like this. So you increase A and you increase Q. You have a learning effect, which all together look like this. And let's assume for now that there are no spillovers. So spillovers are zero. What happens is that your productivity, your general productivity looks like this. You have a level of effort to maximize productivity. And because you do not have any channel toward, toward which internalizing the level of your effort on the other firm, because there are no spillovers, what you do is you maximize productivity. You want to be as competitive as possible in the competition stage, you maximize productivity. And in fact, it's the same level that allows you to compete at the, uh, uh, at the best way you can in the competition stage. But what happens if we introduce spillovers? So if we introduce spillovers, we put H uh, on the sub side of the, of the vertical. And now you have a little bit of effect on the productivity of your rival, which works as a negative component in your productivity. So basically, you are doing less good in terms of relative, relative term because you are fostering, you are fueling the productivity of your rival. So what happens is that now you have this uh, new curve, and you have to adjust your level of productivity. And in order to do so, you actually shift the level of productivity towards the right. Why? Because if you, if you put it toward the left, you're actually increasing the level of spillover. And so what you want to do is to push it toward the right side. 
which is the new level that maximizes profit. And this is graphically the result from the, uh, let's say, reduced form analysis. So assume that the, the condition in this lemma are satisfied. So there exists a, an interior solution because you can, I guess you can Im immediately see that if this wage curve is extremely steep, maybe you have the optimal point after uh, the maximum level. And in that case, you have a coldness, so no problem. But in case uh, 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 an interior solution exists, then management control is weakly more intense when firms face the threat of knowledge pillovers benefiting their rivals. And this can, uh, comes at the cost of lower productivity level. So we have, a, in fact, a, this is in fact a tale of all that pro problem. The firm, by adjusting the level of effort of the workers, is also implicitly uh, adjusting the level of learning of these workers. And because learning is positive for productivity, the possibility of a spillover generates an old up problem, no, you, an appropriability problem that generates an old up of investments. And firms are willing to reduce the investments in order to not benefit the rival of their loss in productivity. Which, of course, create a problem because eventually you have a larger level of productivity of effort put into, into production, a lower level of productivity in the end, and that might affect pricing and level of output and eventually social welfare and consumer service. Now, I wanted to go uh, more uh, deeply into that, so I basically uh, decided to start with an illustrative model. So let's try a standard Cournot model. Um, I had to do a couple of assumptions on the level of productivity, on the, sorry, on the production functions of the firm, which are function of the labor input uh, adopted, which is multiplied by this fraction that is general productivity minus the effort. So the level of effort is in fact positively correlated with wage, to, with, the, with the level of production. Um, Inverse, linear, the, linear inverse demand function, super standard. Worker salary is standard and constant in the, in the parameter. Uh, the learning curve is the one that I microfounded in the, in the general uh, function. So it's basically a parameter, a value parameter that assign a value to learning. And then this uh, component outside the parenthesis matches the fact that the more you, the more you the more effort you put, the more you produce, but you basically lose in terms of uh, intensity. Putting everything together, we have a, this kind of marginal cost function. So this is the basic component. You have a probability, you have the productivity level, which is adjusted by the level of effort, which decreases the cost. Minus, this is cost, so minus means the cost decrease. The learning component and the spillover effect probability of gaining something from the from the from what happens on the other third. Now solving the Cournot model we have is the sum equilibria. The unique symmetric equilibrium is this one. You have a level of investment that is decreasing sorry, a level of um, effort, a level of management control, which is decreasing in the value of learning, which makes sense. Now consider this graph, again, this uh, uh, bell-shaped graph here. The larger the, va the value of learning, the more steep is this bell. You want to get closer to the maximum of this function. Um, is interestingly is is increasing in the level of spillover. So the more now we have this relationship, which is the one that we highlighted in the general frame. So the more intense is the spillover, the larger is the level of uh, management control. So I want to reduce at most the acquisition of knowledge because I know that the larger the spillover, the larger the probability of that knowledge to go into, uh, into the productivity of the other company. And therefore, what I do is, if the risk of circulation increase, what should I do is to decrease the size 
of, of knowledge creation. And that is where the old up argument, I think it's in particular, particularly inter interesting. Um, then I, because I had a functional form, I could go and, and see um, the social welfare effect. So I use a standard social welfare function, profits, consumer surplus, no worker utility. So it's a utilitarian, utilitarian IO, completely standard uh, social welfare function. And what I found is that indeed the, so the second best, you no, know, allowing the, the 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 social planner to choose only the effort and not the quantity in the competition stage. So if the social welfare could choose only the level of effort in the in the company, uh, that would be lower than the one chosen by uh, by the by the firms. And that is again matching the old up argument. No, you want less effort and more knowledge creation. Of course, no one could actually propose that the, that the social planner is able to dictate how you should manage your workers inside the company. It's a level of intrusion that is not acceptable. But it, I think it's, a, it's still a theoretical, uh, interesting result. And what I think is more, to, it's more interesting is that the sign of the derivative with respect to the spillover effect is inverse. So actually, the larger the spillover effect, the larger is the level of knowledge that you want to keep and therefore the lower the level of investment. And why so? Because spillovers are in fact, from a social planner, a, a, trans a, a, a transferring uh, mechanism. You are making, you, you are um, generating a lot of knowledge in a company. So workers are very uh, productive. The best thing for the social planner's perspective is to transfer that productivity to the other company and increase the level of productivity in the market so that the prices go down simultaneously. So policymaker, so this is, uh, let's say, this is the first result. The second result is, of course, we cannot work on, on, on E. Uh, the social planner cannot dictate a level of effort. Okay, it can ban slavery, which is, uh, I think it's obvious for everyone. But it cannot really enter in how the company manage the organization of the workers, uh, at least not mm, past the 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 the, the, the boundaries. Uh, but what he can do is can, he, he can design the market for uh, uh, designing the level of below. So he kind of design the market to change or to make some adjustments in how knowledge circulates in the market. So let's say you can actually intervene on the level of sigma. And what I found is that the, level, the optimal level of sigma is a ugly function, uh, but a clearly positively correlated function of the value of innovation, uh, which is kind of funny because it means that in those, uh, and I think it's coherent with the, with the, result, um, with the result above that, in those markets where the, the value of, if, of, of knowledge creation is large, the social planner will, will, is actually willing to ban circulation of knowledge. Um, sorry, to, to foster circulation of knowledge, to uh, make them those workers change job continuously and transfer the level of productivity firms to firms, uh, which is not uh, really the case in those um, market where the knowledge, uh, the value of knowledge is not that large. Now let's forget about the markets at the low end where probably the level of uh, the value of knowledge is so small that we eat the corner solution. So we are not really interested in those, uh, those markets, but in the middle size, in the middle area, so let's say clerks uh, or white collar jobs uh, where I think this is this story is particularly re relevant. What happens is that the, the 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 value of knowledge is so important for the company that they are willing to keep a little bit of those knowledge creation in 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 there, but they are still incentivized to push effort in order to prevent appropriation. And in that case, an intervention of the policymaker is in fact. Uh, quite relevant and can substantially change um, and, and, and is discrete. So it's not a full ban, it's an intermediate level that protect uh, the firms and protect and try to protect um, the, the, the workers as well. 
Now, um, just to give you a little bit uh, the idea that there is an interior solution, this is a numerical computation. I, I have the, the, the closed form solution, so it's not really, um, it's not necessary, but I think it's graphic, the, the, the impact, the visive impact is actually, is, is better with a numerical solution, but it's, again, it's a closed form. So um, what is what's happening is that you have uh, clearly an increasing function of sigma as the value of knowledge increase. So as the value of knowledge increase, you have a larger level of over in the market. Whereas if the level of, if the value of, uh, of knowledge is very low, and in particular here is equal to the salary, so there is no gain from, uh, there is no, uh, let's say, complementarity from, from learning, uh, then you want to ban circulation, but this is not really something that applies, but because here we have a solution. So it's kind of a, a, a theoretical example. Now, um, mentioned that this is a flexible framework. And in fact, uh, all the results are replicable with many, many models of competition. I tried with Cournot, I tried with Singh and Vivesh uh, in quantities uh, competition, Singh and Vivesh demand function prices competition, hotel uh, competition, and all the results share the same features. So they are decreasing in, they are in, sorry, uh, the level of effort in equilibrium is increasing in, in, the, in the spillover effect and decreasing in the value of, uh, of uh, of knowledge. Now that allows me to kind of draw some policy implication. Uh, the most important is that we have a problem of hold up, so we have a problem of efficiency, and it's a problem of, e of efficiency that is ultimately generated by uh, a policy intervention. Uh, a policy intervention. Don't get me wrong; it's already inefficient. So it's not that it's a bad uh, it's a bad policy design. I'm not judging the merit of the policy design. I'm just saying that it's possibly that it might create some unintended effect that the regulator should take into account to have the most desirable outcome. Because that intervention might trigger some uh, inefficiency creation that comes from the fact that firms are willing to adjust their level of uh, control, which is very fairly simple to do so because you have a lot of technologies that allow you to monitor workers. And in fact, the, the one, one, I, I, one thing that I hope you notice is that we I don't have investment cost function in this in this model. There is no convex cost function. So of course there is a a negative effect of uh, effort on learning, which is a cost opportunity, which operates as a cost function. Uh, but also it means that you already have the level the the technology that you need to adjust organization. Your decision is how you want to design organization, given that you already have the technology and you don't have to make any investments to do so. Um, now, let me just uh, briefly uh, add something on the level of competition. What I couldn't show you here is that um, if, you do, if you do the experiment with other firms, competition seems to exacerbate the incentive. And this is true also if you uh, increase sigma, which means the level of firm specificity is very low. So you actually have competition in terms of technological adoption. That means that your worker can work in the other company basically with no cost. Uh, and that exacerbates these incentives. And then uh, there seems to be a difference effect on low and high cognitive workers. But this is a tentative discussion. I do not have the instrument to completely delve into this discussion because I only have one type of worker. And this is my immediate extension program is to go to our differentiation of uh, of uh, of types of workers and the prediction is that more intense reaction by firms in terms of management control are in sectors with relatively lower uh, cognitive workers why because if you work with highly cognitive workers it means that you really value their knowledge and you are probably less willing to lose that value by sacrifice by by this trade off no by intensifying uh, uh, management control so this close my presentation uh, this is the dolly parton uh, 9 to 5 and odd jobs album cover it's a song that i love so i decided to use it as a motivation let's say <laughs> that's great luca uh, thank you very much for uh, thanks a lot for this presentation
Um, do we have any comments, questions from the people in the audience? I I have some, but I don't want to you know to step in first. So people, please um, don't hesitate to ask. Um, yeah, I, I guess uh, they are shy, so I, I will start if you don't mind. Absolutely. Uh, I, I was wondering, you referred to a potential dynamic version or in any case, something with more uh, steps, let's say. Yes. And I was wondering if uh, at least in some labor markets, a heritage effect is relevant. So, you know, the... There is this idea of me working in a company for 20 years makes me part of the company and I don't want to leave because basically this company is a part of me. And uh, I see. Um, That's an interesting question. I, uh, perhaps it's irrelevant for what you do, but I'm wondering how this thing would affect the applicability of your findings in different work market, uh, labor markets. So perhaps oh, let's say, in some cases um, uh, it's very relevant, in some others it's totally irrelevant. Yeah, le uh, let's say uh, the, the idea of dynamic that I had in mind was like mm -hmm. uh, workers live in two periods. Mm -hmm. So you can only transfer one period to the other one, but it's not that you have seniority. I see, I see. Uh, it is true, though, that uh, in the original attempts that I made to arrive to this solution, I also try to understand what happens when you have the problem of losing a worker and possibly a value uh, a knowledgeable worker mm -hmm. uh, which comes to cost in the sense that you assume you are like uh, i remember there is this uh, example in train creation which is apparently a very complex uh, industry and and the and the the way the industry has developed during time very recently is that 20 years ago there used to be a head engineer who actually knew the blueprint by memory of of mm -hmm. the trains and could actually intervene in every part of the project of the production. And now you don't have them anymore. You have new engineers who are, you know, much more focused on narrower uh, part of the project. Mm -hmm. uh, and that I think was also in, 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 in an attempt to, to, to prevent the, um, the company from the possibility, uh, you know, you have this head engineer who retire. And there you have, you know, a stock of knowledge that disappears because at the end of the day, that knowledge is in the head of the workers it's not, and is not appropriated by the by the company. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so in order to avoid this, you you want to you know just fragment the level of knowledge that each workers want to create, and I think it goes in the same direction. Yeah. Uh, but but yeah, but I do not have a formal proof for 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 no, saying no, no, it's just an intuition. Th this would be nice, in fact. Um... Then uh, the other thing you talked about is this idea of more spillovers uh, would imply lower prices, so higher social, uh, higher consumer surplus. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Uh, but if I am a company and I care about prices and spillovers have this effect, wouldn't I uh, react to that? So if more spillovers imply lower prices, this hurts me in the future. So I would react well, to this by um, lowering the spillovers. So in, in order to keep the you. prices high. Thank you. I think it's a tricky question, but it's uh, but the answer is no um, for, for this reason. So it would be true if uh, there was the Ceteris Paribus. Mm -hmm. So you increase the level of effort, the prices go down. That would be true. But what happens is that you increase the level of effort Sorry, uh, the other way around. You increase the level of effort, the prices goes up. Mm -hmm. But this is mm, so the, the the if you reduce it, the prices go down. But what happens is that you the, you reduce the level of effort and the productivity goes up. The productivity mm -hmm. here enters the cost function, so you basically produce at a lower cost. And because the prices are a function of the cost, also the monopoly price is a function of the I cost. See. It actually goes down. So it's not a it's not a um, it's basically a mechanic reaction, not a strategic one. I understand. Okay. And, because and I it's due to the like fact that, that you have a transfer yeah. of efficiency. Again, my point is about this dynamic version. Like if I see that speed loggers have this effect on prices, uh, then I might want to you know, um, go back and re redesign my behavior or something. Well, let's um, say that, yeah, let's say that I... I 
I kind I think I I had this result in the sense that firms prefer to have larger price. So eventually uh, you you you, you lower see. your productivity, which comes to higher ah. price and higher cost. Mm -hmm. But of course, in the general uh, in the general function, you do not know how the the elasticity of the price. So you don't know exactly if you gain if you lose. Mm -hmm. But it's a price that you want to pay. So you want to be less efficient because you simply want to shut down the connection mm -hmm. with the rival. Mm -hmm. I see. I see. And uh, in the in the dynamic version, works kind of the same. The only different things is that I allow circulation within periods. Mm -hmm. um, what I what I haven't checked yet is if I have a, a proper labor market in which firms poach for the other ones. I so see. I wants to hire the workers of the other company yeah. that might affect the decision of the of the of the firm but that makes the problem much more complex so yeah definitely um I, I have a final point but perhaps somebody in the audience wants to ask something um yeah guys don't don't be shy um hit him <laughs> Um, so, okay, I don't know if there are no more questions, I will ask my last one. Um, so these days, but this is not something that uh, appeared only in December of 2023, uh, there was this uh, thing that Tesla published uh, the blueprints, as you said earlier, of uh, its batteries or something, of a specific component of its cars in any case. And uh, they, they sent the blueprints to other car manufacturers, basically, uh, you know, allowing for, for full spillovers, spillovers 100% or something. Then in that case, we have spillovers, but without any workers moving around. And in fact, if you commit to share the blueprints with a competitor, no matter what your worker does, then in that case, the worker has no incentive uh, to leave uh, exactly because in any case, you will share the, the blueprints, right? I was wondering if we can learn something from your work regarding this kind of stuff. So free patenting or no patenting in any case, like uh, knowledge moving around without any constraints. Well, I guess uh, that that would help. Uh, that would help a lot in the sense that if you don't have the possibility to protect your information because you, either by design of the market or because you're, uh, I don't know, you are uh, particularly interested in free circulation of knowledge, then you don't really, you're not really afraid of those workers bringing out the knowledge, mm -hmm. and that, I mean, I guess that might be. Um, that means that basically what. What the firms would do if if it doesn't internalize the negative effect of of sharing, mm -hmm. uh, it would basically maximize productivity. So yeah, I think that would be that would be my prediction. Of course, sure. then then mm -hmm. I there are many other things that go that goes on. I mean, my model is not really target on uh, patentable technology. Mm -hmm. It's more like about worker touch knowledge. You no, know, those yeah, kind yeah. of information that they gather. And correct. it's proprietary of the worker, not of the company. This is correct. Um, you are right. Perhaps this is irrelevant, in fact. Uh, no, I, 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 I'm not sure it's irrelevant. It's, it's more complex, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I'm just asking, you know, because there is some, um, I don't know if it's literature, but people argue that there might be some uh, economics behind this behavior. So Tesla is doing that because, yeah, it might not make sense in terms of... Um, uh, protecting their technology, but it might make sense in terms of, uh, you know, uh, CSR or, uh, I don't know, uh, in terms of competition or something. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I I, I yeah. do not believe in irrational moves, so I think it's... Oh, okay. uh, no, but that... I remember reading, for instance, that if you work for Tesla and Tesla commits to share what you produce for them with everybody else, then perhaps this works as an incentive for you to work harder and harder every day to produce the next idea and the one after that. So well, yeah, yeah, it works that... as a platform for ideas. Yeah, exactly. Um, um, kind of a signal mechanism. Yeah, I see. I see. Okay, I, I am, uh, I'm done with my questions. I again, um, I don't know if anybody in the audience wants to ask something, make a comment. Um, I will also stop the recording.